NASA burns $4 billion yearly just maintaining the ISS, not upgrading it, not expanding it, just keeping it alive. By 2030, it shuts down completely. What happens to America's orbital presence then? SpaceX found an answer that costs under $2 billion to build versus the ISS's $150 billion. Starship's internal volume matches the entire ISS, but launches as one complete station, not piece by piece over decades. How does that change everything? Here's the thing most people miss about this shift. Trump's executive order isn't just policy paperwork. It's a complete reversal of how NASA has operated since the 1960s. The order is called Ensuring American Space Superiority, and it transforms NASA from a builder into a buyer. Instead of spending decades designing rockets and stations from scratch, NASA now purchases what private companies already make. Why does that matter? Because the old way has been bleeding money for years. Take the ISS. It costs three to four billion annually just for maintenance, not research. Not new modules, just keeping the lights on. That's money pulled directly from Artemis, Mars missions, and next-generation propulsion research. Every dollar keeping the ISS alive is a dollar not building the future. The question nobody asks is this. If we're already losing that money, why not redirect it towards something that actually grows? That's where commercial stations enter. NASA won't own them. It'll rent space. Crew time, experiment slots, cargo services. The private sector carries the financial risk now, not taxpayers. But here's the part that changes everything. These stations don't just serve NASA. They serve pharmaceutical companies testing drugs in microgravity. Materials, science startups developing new alloys. Media companies filming in orbit. Space tourists paying six figures for the experience. When you have multiple revenue streams, you don't need government life support. The station funds itself. Can a government-run facility ever compete with that business model? Four companies are currently racing to build these commercial stations. Axiom Space is designing a modular platform that initially attaches to the ISS before flying independently. Blue Origin's Orbital Reef promises a mixed-use business park in space with room for 10 people. Voyager Space partnered with Airbus on Star Lab, a single-launch inflatable station. Northrop Grumman proposed a design based on its Cygnus cargo modules. NASA's betting not all of them succeed. It wants competition, not a monopoly. Only one or two will reach sustained operation. That's intentional. Competition drives innovation faster than any government mandate ever could. But there's a player everyone's watching who hasn't officially entered the race. SpaceX. And they have something none of the others possess. Starship. Every space station ever launched was designed around a fundamental constraint. Rockets could only lift about 20 tons at a time. The ISS, Mir, Skylab, even today's commercial designs, all built in pieces, assembled in orbit module by module over years. Starship obliterates that limitation. Its internal volume exceeds 1,000 cubic meters. That matches the entire ISS in one launch. Here's where it gets interesting. SpaceX already developed most of the systems needed for an orbital station through NASA's $2.9 billion Lunar Starship contract. Life support, propulsion, avionics, power systems. It's all there. Converting a lunar starship into a low-Earth orbit station requires adding solar panels, docking ports, and interior outfitting. Estimated additional cost? $1 to $2 billion total. Compare that to the ISS's $150 billion price tag over three decades. Why would NASA choose anything else? But cost is only part of SpaceX's advantage. The real edge is vertical integration. Axiom needs to buy rocket launches from someone. Blue Origin has to negotiate schedules with launch providers. Voyager depends on NASA for system integration. SpaceX owns everything. 
the rocket, the crew vehicle, the ground systems. That control creates three decisive advantages nobody else can match. First, schedule dominance. If SpaceX wants to launch its station next year, it doesn't need permission or a spot on someone else's manifest. It just goes. Second, cost suppression. SpaceX doesn't pay launch margins to itself. Every competitor has to factor in someone else's profit margin for every launch. SpaceX's margin is internal accounting. Third, design freedom. Competitors design stations that fit existing rockets. SpaceX designs the rocket and station together, optimizing both simultaneously. No other player in this market can do that. Does that make the competition pointless before it even starts? Not necessarily. Here's the strategic calculation Washington is making. This commercialization model delivers three massive advantages if it works. Flexibility first. Multiple stations mean multiple points of access. If one company goes bankrupt, others keep operating. The network survives individual failures. Contrast that with the ISS. One station, one point of failure. When it goes dark in 2030, America's entire LEO presence disappears unless something replaces it. Multiple commercial stations build in redundancy. The system grows without collapsing under its own costs. Second advantage, cost effectiveness through market pressure. Private stations can't rely on endless government funding. They must attract investors and customers or die. That pressure forces efficiency government programs never face. Competition naturally pushes toward leaner operations. Companies automate more, reduce crew size, design modular systems that upgrade quickly. A private station could be retired and replaced every decade as technology advances. The ISS can't be overhauled. It's locked into 1990s engineering forever. Third advantage, speed of innovation. Market pressure and non-government customers force private companies to evolve faster than any centralized government program. The philosophy shifts completely. A space station isn't a national monument anymore. It's a commercial product. And products are meant to be improved, not preserved. How fast could a company iterate if survival depends on staying ahead of competitors? There's a fourth advantage nobody talks about enough. Soft power. By setting the commercial rules, U.S. standards quietly become global defaults. Docking systems, crew procedures, hardware interfaces, all designed around American norms. Foreign governments don't negotiate partnerships. They buy services like any other customer. It's commerce disguised as diplomacy. Market control instead of political alignment. China builds through government mandate. America builds through market dominance. Which model spreads faster globally? But this gamble carries serious risks. The first is market demand. The entire model assumes booming industries, space tourism, in-space manufacturing, commercial research. What if those markets don't materialize fast enough? Stations need paying customers to survive. No customers, no cash flow. Unlike China's Tiangong, which runs on steady government funding, regardless of commercial viability, American stations must prove their worth in the market. If demand falls short, the whole network could unravel. Are we betting America's orbital future on industries that don't exist yet? Second risk, financial fragility. Private companies now carry the burden. Long-term financial risk, operational costs, bankruptcy threats. Some will run out of money. Some will cancel projects. The system is messy by design. It encourages rapid innovation but sacrifices the predictability of centralized planning. What you gain in creativity, you lose in stability. Is that trade-off worth it when national security depends on orbital access? Third risk, strategic consequences. If this experiment fails, America doesn't just lose a few research missions, it loses leadership. China's stable, state-backed model fills the vacuum and becomes the default system for LEO operations worldwide. 
The American model aims for redundancy through multiple commercial stations, but in its early years it's actually more fragile. Companies are still searching for profit and sustainability. They're vulnerable. One major failure could cascade through the entire network before the market matures. So here's the real question nobody's answering yet. Is SpaceX's Starship Station the brilliant solution that saves American space dominance? Or is it a shortcut that looks genius until the market reality hits? Here's what makes this moment different from anything in space history. We're watching a 60-year-old model collapse in real time. NASA built the ISS the old way, decades of planning. $150 billion, assembled piece by piece. By 2030, it's gone, and America's betting its entire orbital future on companies that have to make a profit or disappear. SpaceX's Starship station could launch for under $2 billion. One launch, one station, fully operational. That's not an incremental improvement. That's a complete reset of what's possible. But here's the tension nobody's resolving. If the commercial market doesn't materialize fast enough, those stations fail. And if they fail, China's state-funded model becomes the default, while America scrambles to rebuild what it just abandoned. This isn't just about SpaceX versus Blue Origin or Axiom. It's about whether free market competition can move faster than centralized government control. China's playing the long game with guaranteed funding. America's playing the high-risk, high-reward game with no safety net. One model guarantees stability. The other promises innovation. We're about to find out which one wins. So what do you think? Is commercial space the future, or are we watching a high-stakes gamble that could cost America its lead? Drop your thoughts in the comments. If this breakdown gave you a new perspective, hit that like button and share it with someone who needs to see where space is actually heading. And subscribe to Atlas Space because this race is just getting started. We'll be covering every move as it happens. Starships transforming Moonbase Alpha into reality with full reusability and record low launch costs. The construction phase looks unstoppable. But what happens when we shift to large-scale lunar mining? Suddenly, every rocket launch becomes a financial nightmare. Fuel costs, constant refueling, repeat missions hauling tons of materials back to Earth. Musk predicted this exact problem years ago. His solution? A 1970s electromagnetic launch track powered purely by the moon's endless solar energy. No fuel needed capable of flinging 600,000 tons into orbit annually at a fraction of rocket costs. Can this forgotten technology actually replace rockets and revolutionize lunar operations forever? Let's break down why this matters. Earth's gravity pulls at 9.8 meters per second squared, forcing rockets to 